Good afternoon, distinguished guests, former Chancellor Kerwin, Ambassador Zaron, and members of the Sadat family. Welcome to this momentous occasion, remembering Jehan Sadat. I would like to start our ceremony today with a quote from Ms. Jehan Sadat. I never again want to see the face of a starving child or hear the weeping of a mother who has lost her son to war. Peace, this is what my husband gave his life for, and I want the world to know that he did not die in vain. Peace, this is what will make me very happy. So it's my privilege and my honor to begin this tribute to Dr. Jehan Sadat, who left behind a lasting legacy that will undoubtedly be remembered well into the future. Her legacy is food and water to a world hungry for peace and social justice. Certainly, during her time as the First Lady of Egypt, and after she lost her husband, President Anwar Sadat, she dedicated herself to supporting and advancing his struggle for peace and justice. But in the process, she established her own path, her own legacy, especially advancing women's rights in a world that desperately needs more equal rights for women. I welcome our panel today that includes those who knew Dr. Sadat very well, who worked with her closely, and who loved her the best, members of her, of her family and distinguished friends who will be introduced later by our own moderator, Dr. Shibli Talhani, the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development. For over a quarter century, Dr. Sadat was a fellow at the College of Behavior and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland. 12 years ago, she wrote these words, peace, this word, this idea, this goal is a defining theme of my life. I am always hoping and praying for peace. Today, we face challenges that remind us how closely connected we are by our shared humanity. The struggle to contain a worldwide pandemic, the longstanding fight for racial and social justice. Many around the world have called on the Taliban to respect women's and girls' rights and access to education as they took power in war-torn Afghanistan. Already, the Taliban are taking steps to restrict them, including making certain subjects off limits to female students. Racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, senseless murders fueled by hatred, racial and social inequities are all too common in our society today, sometimes even occurring right here on our very campus. American history has given us abundant proof that even as society makes significant gains in gender equality and anti-racism, misogyny, white supremacy, anti-blackness, and racism can still increase. How do we as scholars, students, advocates, and leaders address these forces that threaten to undo the progress that's been made by leaders like President Sadat and Jehan Sadat? Progress that people have sacrificed their lives trying to defend. It is in the spirit that the Sadat Chair for Peace and Development was established at the University of Maryland a quarter of a century ago with the active support of Dr. Sadat and the help of the leader of our university at the time, one of our panelists today, Dr. William Kerwin, who also recruited Professor Tahami, a world-renowned scholar of foreign policy in the Middle East away from Cornell University to lead the effort. Through the research and public policy efforts of the chair, the mission of social justice, peace, and development continues unabated. Through research, writing, and public opinion polls on issues of social justice and conflict of peace, the journey continues. Over the years, the chair has brought extraordinary world leaders to campus, including Nelson Mandela, Mary Robinson, Kofi Annan, Jimmy Carter, and the Dalai Lama. At the, th at the end of this remembrance, we will watch together a slideshow of Dr. Sadat's moments at Maryland, especially those moments when the chair hosted international luminaries. We can look to the shining example of Dr. Jehan Sadat's commitment to peace and try to follow in her very large footsteps. She was a champion of social justice 
and women's rights in Egypt before and after the assassination of her husband. She microfinanced small projects and economically empowered women. She led the Egyptian delegations to international conferences on women. She spearheaded efforts to change laws to improve the divorce status of women and their representation in the Egyptian parliament. She mounted exhibitions to show women how to sell their work. She realized that if women are economically empowered, then they will also be politically empowered. She used love, she used her life partnership with President Sadat to propel her forward with courage, to seize the moment, to face her fears, to fight for justice on behalf of women, children, all people who need peace and justice. Dr. Sadat embodied our university's mantra, fearless ideas solve grand challenges. Let us use Dr. Jehan Sadat's life as inspiration and impetus to make a difference in our world. Thank you. Dean Ball. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for this special remembrance of Dr. Jahan Sadat, who contributed a great deal to our college and university over a period of three decades. We are grateful for all that she has done and will always remember her fondly through the work of the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development housed in the Department of Government and Politics in our College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. But first, it is my honor and pleasure to read a message from President and Mrs. Jimmy Carter written for this occasion. From President Carter. Rosalind and I are sorry that we could not be with you today to celebrate the life of Dr. Jahan Sadat. We have been deeply saddened by her passing and we join you in mourning the passing of an extraordinary woman. Throughout her remarkable life, she has been a blessing to countless people and we are proud to have called her our friend. We first met Dr. Sadat in April, 1977 at the White House. After the assassination of her husband, Rosalind and I attended the funeral, and I later wrote in my book, Keeping Faith, Jahan was superb. She was beautiful in her sorrow and in the strength and dignity with which she faced the large group that filled her sitting room. She made it clear to us that Sadat had given his life for the Middle East peace that he and Menachem Begin and I had consummated and that she and Mubarak were ready to give their lives for the same goal. We are grateful for having been personally touched by her leadership and kindness. Her ongoing commitment to education and peace will be an inspiration for generations to come. Please know that you are in our hearts and prayers. We hope your warm memories and the love and prayers of family and friends will be comfort to you in the days ahead. Sincerely, Jimmy Carter. Now allow me to introduce Ambassador Motaz Zaran, the Ambassador of Egypt to the United States, to offer some remarks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ball and Dr. Tahami and President Pines, Dr. Hawass, Ambassador Talawi, Dr. Kirwan, and of course the esteemed uh, members of the Sadat family. Um, I would like to, to start by extending gratitude to the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development for organizing this forum and for gov giving me the opportunity to contribute to the commemoration of the legacy of an iconic lady who has always been a source of inspiration to successive generations and a true ambassador of Egypt in the absolute sense and meaning of the title, namely, late Mrs. Jehan Sadat. Mrs. Sadat was a unique uh, character. She succeeded in positioning herself as a role model for women, not only in Egypt, but across the world. A vivid testament is our current virtual gathering today. Undoubtedly, ev everyone's life eventually ends, but it is the details of how they lived that distinguish one person from another. Mrs. Sadat has lived 
like a candle in the wind. And certainly thousands or even millions of candles can be lit from a single candle. That's why millions of Egyptian women have uh, been inspired by Mrs. Sadat and will always mourn her departure, but cherish her legacy. I and others who had not the privilege of knowing in person Mrs. Sadat and her glowing and glittering persona can speak at length about Mrs. Sadat's illustrious role as one of the leading personalities who shaped the course of history in modern Egypt. So just imagine what those who had the honor and the privilege of knowing her up close and personal. Now as such, allow me to focus very, very briefly based on her must read autobiography and the testimonies of her close circle on Mrs. Sadat as a wife, as a staunch advocate for women's rights and charitable action, and as a steadfast defender of peace. Mrs. Sadat has set an example of a wife who supports her husband during drastic, delicate telling and testing times. She stood vigorously and firmly behind Mr. Sadat when he was an ambitious young military officer during pivotal crossroads in Egypt's history. And later on, when he naturally and seamlessly climbed slowly but surely the hierarchical ladder until he became vice president and then president. In fact, a visionary one. As a devoted advocate for charity and women's empowerment, Mrs. Sadat spearheaded changes to Egypt's civil laws, which paved the way to grant women the right to alimony and custody of children in case of divorce. She continued persistently in sailing against the wind by tackling precarious and delicate issues that were perceived as taboos in a society by certain segments in Egypt. In this context, Egyptians who lived through President Sadat's tenure remember with pride that Mrs. Sadat was vocal and proactive in condemning female gen genital, genital mutilation, as well as helping local women to become economically independent from their husbands and equal opportunities to education and healthcare and opportunities for jobs. She engaged as well in numerous initiatives, including the establishment of a charity organization to benefit veterans and civilians, as well as her significant and substantive involvements with the Egyptian Red Crescent and the Egyptian Society for Cancer Patients. We remember with pride that Mrs. Sadat was a staunch defender of peace, like her beloved husband, and nothing can attest to that better than her own words, which President Pines quoted in the very beginning in his introduction. And let me just say, because of these are considered to be words of wisdom, they are worthy of repeating. Quote, never again would I want to see the face of a strong child and a starving child or hear the weeping of a mother who has lost her son in war. Peace, this is what my husband gave his life for, and I want the world to know that he did not die in vain. Peace is what I and will make and uh, uh, aspire to be as happy as we can." Unquote. Now, I would like to conclude by affirming that maybe the most valuable tribute to someone who passed away is not grief, but in fact, gratitude. We will always be grateful, appreciative, and yes, forever indebted to Mrs. Sadat for being such an illustrious personality of stellar and splendid qualities. This was merely a glimpse of her living legacy let this everlasting legacy guide us all in all our endeavors 
and everything we do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for these lovely words um, to uh, honor and celebrate the life of this great woman that we all counted as our friend. Um, um, now I'm, I'm pleased to introduce a panel uh, to get a little more glimpse of this woman's, this extraordinary woman of Egypt's life. Um, uh, people who knew her best, people who were close to her, people who loved her, people who worked with her. And um, start, let me introduce them uh, briefly, uh, uh, and then we'll, have, we'll start a conversation. Um, uh, we have three uh, family members, um, uh, and other family members, by the way, are joining, are watching us uh, now as well. Uh, but uh, let me start with Nuha Sadat, uh, who is the daughter of Jehan and Anwar Sadat. Uh, uh, Nuha, I, I know that uh, many people here on this panel have uh, had known Mrs. Sadat for decades. I've uh, personally known her for over a quarter century, uh, but no one obviously here knows her better than Nuha. Uh, and Nuha not only knew her throughout her life, but she was she had been very close to her. And uh, toward the end, she spent so much time with her in her final days and give us a, a, a wonderful window into her life. So thank you, Noha, for, for joining us. We really are honored to have you, appreciate you joining us. Um, and then we have two um, uh, grandchildren. Let me start with Sharif Marai. Um, and Sharif um, uh, is the eldest of a um, uh, 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 grandchild of uh, Jehan and Anwar Sadat. Um, he, because he's the eldest, as you know, that's tradition in, in the Middle East that the eldest, well, everywhere gets a little more attention. Uh, he certainly uh, got a lot of attention from his grandparents and spent a lot of time with them uh, and traveled even with them while uh, President Sadat was still alive. And he was very close to both his, his, his grandfather and later his uh, grandmother. Um, he's in, in agribusiness and owns Arabian uh, horses. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's been a, a uh, it, it's really wonderful to have you join us, Sharif, uh, to tell us more. And then we also have Sarah Murray, who is the granddaughter of uh, uh, President Jahan Sadat. Uh, she's the mother of two children, and she is an Egyptologist. So we have two Egyptologists on this panel. Uh, one a young and uh, aspiring one and not really aspiring one. she's already uh, involved she's, she's uh, including in the, uh, working in the Egyptian museum excavating at the pyramids of Giza uh, but obviously uh, we also have um, another Egyptologist who is a great one uh, which is uh, Dr. Zahi Hawass who's joining us. Um, Dr. Zahi is world renowned most of you uh, may have heard of him or seen him or seen pictures of him with his hat that is hard to miss most of the time. Uh, but he is one of the great archaeologists in the world and certainly the leading Egyptologist. Uh, he has uh, also been Minister of Antiquities. Um, he, had, uh, he has a, a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. He's written many academic articles. He's uh, Director of Excavations at, at Giza, Sapara. Uh, and the Valley of the Kings. He's led many discoveries. And I could tell you, uh, those of us who had the privilege of, of, of hearing him or, or having him show us some of these antiquities, that is, is something to, to not to be missed because I've been one of the beneficiaries of being in a small group with the, uh, that he accompanied. Um, but more importantly for our uh, uh, event today uh, is that he knew uh, Dr. Jehan Sadat very well, and he had multiple events with her, and I'd love to hear him on that. And uh, next is um, Ambassador Mirvat Talawi. Um, she's an extraordinary woman by her, uh, in her own right. Um, obviously, we're, we're celebrating an extraordinary woman today, the life of an extraordinary woman. But Dr. Talawi is a, a truly accomplished woman who has led on women's rights, um, both within Egypt and globally. Um, she's the former president of the uh, National Council for Women and former Egyptian minister. Uh, she was a deputy director of the United Nations International Research and Training Institute. And she spent 
a good amount of time working with Mrs. Sadat early on on women's issues, which I would love to hear uh, from her about uh, today. And last but not least is our own uh, extraordinary academic leader, uh, William Brett Kerwin. Uh, Dr. Kerwin, um, you know, is, is uh, uh, nationally and internationally known as one of the great academic leaders. Uh, um, he was the president of our university when uh, Dr. Sadat was brought to University of Maryland, and he was extremely instrumental uh, in establishing the Sadat chair. He later, by the way, became also uh, president at the Ohio State University, he became the chancellor of the university system in Maryland. He held many other national uh, positions, uh, but for our purpose, he was the one at Maryland who, one of the early people to have encountered Jahan Sadat, be impressed with her. I'd love to hear about him. He was, of course, not alone when she was brought in. I should also mention um, uh, the work of uh, the late um, Dean Irv Goldstein, from, um, who, uh, who was uh, very instrumental. His uh, able associate, uh, 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 Stuart uh, Edelstein, and, and then uh, the, the chair of the government department, uh, at that time, uh, John Wilkenfeld, and one other person I want to single out for helping to establish particularly that chair and support the effort of Dr. Jehan Sadat on campus was a proud Egyptian American from Hollywood, uh, Frank Agrama, who was extremely helpful uh, to Mrs. Sadat and the Sadat chair early on uh, when Dr. Kerwin uh, worked hard to make this uh, uh, happen. Uh, so let me start um, by moderating conversation. And the first person I want to ask is Noha. Uh, Noha, I want, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, I've known this great lady for over a quarter century now. Uh, and I've uh, been close enough to her to know her strengths and to understand what moves her up to a point. But I still, when I review her life, I still cannot capture what is the driving force? Where is the strength coming from uh, that um, animates a history that is highly unusual, especially in, our, in, in the Middle East region? And I mean, you look at this lady, she marries very young to a man who is much older, a man who was a revolutionary, unemployed revolutionary. This was a gamble in a way that uh, already shed some light about what drives her. A man who had just served in prison because he worked hard to bring freedom and independence for his own people. And so she gambles on him right away. And within just three years, he becomes one of the most important people in Egypt when the Egyptian revolution takes place. And he becomes a central figure in the ruling elite, even long before he became president. And she becomes a central player as a partner with the president. Uh, not marginalized, but very actively involved with him along the way, in a way that, uh, as Ambassador uh, uh, Zahran said, alienated people who are not used to that. Uh, but she certainly was with him, uh, all the way. He obviously, it showed his strength in allowing that in a traditional area despite the criticism. But here is a person who moves through uh, and then she rises as uh, the first lady of Egypt uh, at a time when uh, Anwar Sadat uh, was propelled into stardom, particularly after the 1973 war, when the Egyptian uh, military performed more better than anybody expected in the effort to regain the occupied Sinai and later became a global celebrity for, uh, you know, uh, launching his, his peace efforts. And, and so she's up there with him, a star. And yet, at the very same time, she's raising a family. And at the very same time, she's not satisfied without getting more education. So she goes to get a BA, she goes to get an MA, even before President Sadat was assassinated. And then the president dies, he's killed early, he's assassinated in a tragedy that the world mourned. And 
Uh, she's widowed uh, nearly for uh, half of her life. And, uh, and she still launches her own effort to get a doctorate, to get a PhD, to pursue her own path. Uh, all the meanwhile, she's leading on women's issues as we have heard along the way. So I want to ask you this question, Noha. Uh, you, were, you were living through all these years, certainly not from the very beginning, but throughout much of that. And I, I want to, to give us a window into what, what drove this woman, what gave her strength, what she, what, how did she survive all these ups and downs uh, throughout her life? She was always a very, very, very strong woman, my mother. And uh, this, this strength, it, it, you can see it first when she first met my father. And uh, she was very, very young at the time. And yet, she, before she met him, she had heard a lot about him from her, her cousin's husband. And, and, this, and she, she had this image of him. She was very patriotic. She's always been very Egyptian and she loves this country very much. And she, she felt that Anwar Sadat was a person who loves this country, who is fighting for this country, who is uh, trying uh, very hard, you know, to, to, to get this country to a better place. So even before she met him, she was, you know, like half in love with him already. And then she met him. And when she did, uh, she said, this is the man I'm going to marry. I mean, she was sure that it was him. And against everybody, her, her parents at first were not very happy. Her mother was British and uh, she wasn't happy about this. But my mother persevered and she said, this is the person I'm going to marry. And she did. And this just goes to show you how she was a very strong person. And then as a mother, as a mother, she was my mother and she was also my best friend, really. But as a mother, um, she, always, she always had her priorities very straight, you know. We, as her kids, we were her first priority before anything, whatever she was doing, uh, wherever she was, it was always her children before anything. She was always there for us. And she was always our strength. She was always in our backs, always, all of us, the four of us. And we never ever uh, went to her for advice or, or, or for anything. She was always there, always there for us. She was very strong. And even the day my father was assassinated and it was one of the worst days of our lives. But she stood there and she said, your father would have wanted you all to be strong and we have to stand by President Mubarak and to make sure that everything goes on, that the country survives and that because at the time there was a lot of chaos. And she said, this is not what he would have wanted. And she stood up, she stood up. And then after my father, and uh, uh, she went to the States and she taught there, she forged a new life for herself. She taught and she, she went all over the States for lecture tours, all over the world actually, not the States, for lecture tours. And yet she still was our mother first and foremost, always, always, always. And our grandchildren were closer to her, maybe our children, I mean, were closer to her as her grandchildren more than they were to us. I mean, they would go to her with, problems and with things that they wouldn't come to me with or to their mother's or father with because she was always there for everyone, always. A very strong personality and a very, very loving mother. Very, very loving. This was, I think this was the secret of her strength. She loved everyone and she was, she loved us all and she loved us very much and she gave us everything, everything. And I think this is what shaped us into what we are, what my mother did for us. And uh, I will always, always, always think of her. I always think of her as with us and always think of her as 
the strong person that she is. And you know, we get on with our lives now and we're, we're doing very well because of her. She was always pushing us to be better, to do better. And um, she was very, very strong up to the last moment, up to the last moment, she was strong. And uh, she, she always, and she would never complain. And she would never, uh, 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 she was always, she was a strong person. That's all I can say. A strong, she, strong, strong, loving person. The, the strong and lovely, those, those two words uh, are really appropriate with my own experience with her. It's been an extraordinary uh, experience over the years where she, a lot of people didn't understand how strong and tough she can be when on substantive issues, when she had to stand her ground because she's so polite and she, she's so warm and she's so caring about people uh, that people didn't quite understand that this was a woman of substance that went far beyond and she could be really tough even if very kind at the same time. Uh, and I wanna uh, bring in um, Ambassador Talawi um, just because of this characteristic of um, uh, uh, Dr. Jehan said that, um, and especially on women's issues. I mean, we're all talking about it because obviously she contributed to a lot, including advancing President Sadat's legacy of peace and, and beyond. Uh, but clearly during the presidency and beyond, she championed women issues as everybody recognizes in ways that are lasting and important uh, as a role model for sure, but also in terms of real steps that change the lives of many women. So I want to ask you about your first encounter with her and how you understood this commitment that she had for women's issues. My, my first encounter with uh, Mrs. Sadat was in preparation for her going to uh, the International Women's Conference in Mexico, 75. And uh, there was two views whether she should go or she, she should not attend as head of the Egyptian delegation to this conference. But finally, uh, she said, uh, let us ask the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They called on me and then I met her. And it happened that I convinced her that her role is to go and represent Egypt. She is a, a, a model, an iconic uh, image for uh, Egypt. She should go. And then she called the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and decided because he was in a hurry to decide so they can reserve hotels to the delegation. This was the first encounter. But in Mexico and also in the second UN Women Conference in Copenhagen, she was heading the Egyptian delegation there. And at the time, 1980, the Arab were against Mr. Sadat because of the peace conference. And they decided to uh, be harsh to Mrs. Sadat and to not to allow her voice to be heard when she will deliver her statement. So I stood with the people in charge of the United Nations saying that all doors of the conference should be the hall where she will speak, should be closed and have the security, not to allow anybody because I heard things that they want to, to revenge against President Sadat by hurting Mrs. Sadat. Anyway, our uh, peace, our uh, organization with the UN 
succeeded. The, she delivered her statement, was excellent statement. And the event passed away. I can say that she, the strength and love she has for everybody, not only her family, is because she was charismatic person. She was very charismatic, yet she looks kind, nice, smiling to everybody, but she was very strong and very charismatic. You have to respect her. You have to take her words seriously because at the end, she will take the right decision. This is how I saw Mrs. Sadat in many events. She believed in peace strongly. Uh, when uh, we saw her on the television after the passing of uh, the president Sadat, she was defending the peace agreement better than any politician or analyst in, in uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, she, uh, she is a true believer in women issue, not uh, a show off, but true believer. She always supported us to combine between the family and the work by organizing our time. She did not let any day pass without doing something good for the country. She uh, established an uh, organization called Wafa and Amal for all those uh, officers and soldiers who have been injured in the war to keep them in this association and to give them, provide them with help. And if they don't have a family or somebody to take care of them, then this organization would take care of them. And it is a very important uh, organization. When I was Minister of Social Affairs and Insurance, I was responsible for the civil society organization. I went to Afa and Amal, and I saw it's not a little house. It's 250 acres or Fadan, very big in the middle of the city, uh, with a good hospital to help the people there. She was supervising this organization very closely. And uh, she was also helping women to, uh, to have seats to, or quota in the parliament. And she managed to get 30 seats for the women in the parliament. Many uh, legal documents were passed to help women during her time, or search for children, for education, for culture. She was multi-active uh, in all uh, fields and very serious one, not uh, a superfluous uh, image, but she was really very sensitive. I loved her so much. I can't forget this lady because she is an honest person and uh, God bless her soul. She was a wonderful woman as a friend, as a, a simple woman. She was so simple and so down to earth, although she was the first lady of wish. Nicely said. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that um, everyone who has had the honor and the pleasure to meet her uh, is left with the same impression. Uh, it's unforgettable. Uh, she was a presence. Uh, she was uh, an extraordinary presence, really. Not people talk about charisma, but it went far beyond charisma uh, because you knew at the very same time that she was smiling. And every time I think about her, it brings a smile to my face. 
that behind that smile, there was a woman of substance. Uh, That's just, so, and, and can, that, I add, can I add something? Sure. I was very, very proud that she was the first woman in Egypt to have a military funeral and to be buried next to President Sadat, according to her wish. And uh, the actual President Sisi allowed her by having a military. She did not ask for the military funeral. It was uh, an appreciation by the military to Mrs. Sadat, because she did a lot for helping those who suffered from the war. So all this is something to be written in history. She is the only woman in Egypt to have a, a, a military funeral and to be buried next to her husband. Yes, and she, she represented Egypt honorably with dignity uh, and uh, clearly everyone recognized it. I'm gonna to go to Dr. Zahi, I'm, I'm going to, um, then go to um, uh, President Kerwin and, and uh, I'm going to leave uh, the last comments to Sarah and Sharif uh, of that conversation, a personal one. Obviously, I'd love to end on a personal note. But uh, Dr. Zahi, I mean, um, you have known her over many decades. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to hear first of all how you first met her, uh, but more about also your, um, you know, over the past uh, 10, 20 years, I know you and and she had done so much uh, in particularly with delegations that were coming to Egypt to show um, the strength of Egypt, the wonder of Egypt uh, that you both had, that you could both share. So I'd love to hear your uh, story with her. Uh, you are muted. You are muted still, uh, Dr. Zahi. Okay, now? Yeah. Yes, okay. good. I want first to say that when I was a young inspector at the pyramids. I saw Mrs. Sadat uh, twice and I was really impressed by her. The first time I checked her hand, I was standing at the entrance of Saron Light and she came to a big performance by Frank Sinatra. And the second time she came with President Sadat and Jimmy Carter to the pyramids. And I will never forget, I was explaining the pyramids and I said that the stones of the Great Pyramid of Khufu are 2 million and 300,000 blocks. And President said that, maybe he heard this many times, but he repeated the number of the stones in front of Jimmy Carter to show the culture and how Egypt uh, heritage is so deep that he needs by his voice, and I, I, I can imitate exactly what President Sadat said in that moment. The third time, I used to see her coming to Saqqara to study Egyptology under a professor. His name is Abdelmin Abu Bakr. She loved ancient Egypt so much, and she knew as the first lady, she will travel everywhere. And the only thing that people will ask her is about ancient Egypt. And she, this is why she took lessons about Egyptology. Then how I met her? I think at the first years when she was teaching at the University of Maryland, I was giving a lecture in Washington, DC. And I was flying from Washington, DC airport to New York to take TWA. And I was sitting because in that time it happened a big snowstorm and we could not fly. I looked, I saw her and I came to her to introduce myself. She said, of course, I know you. And we sat, we talked for hours. And since this moment, I became a very good friend of her. But now I'm going to say two important things about her. The first, I went to Mrs. Sadat to give a lecture and she to give a lecture in Reno. 
and there was, she gave a talk. Look, the way that she gives a lecture, it's very impressive. She talks with dignity and power at the same time. And she in front of 3000 people, if you throw anything in the ground, you cannot hear the sound because people were listening to, to her that I have never seen in my life. Audience will do that for any person. After that, the media will talk to her. She was talented in one thing that many people, many people did not recognize, sound bites. She doesn't talk a lot for the, in front of the TV, but she gives sound bites. And this is why I saw all, because in America, actually they love sound bites. And she knew that. And I, she gave in front of me more than 25 beautiful interviews. And what is in her heart? The love of Egypt, the love of her country, the love to the people of Egypt. And I want to come to a point of meeting her in her house. She used to make lots of uh, uh, dinners and uh, lunches, and she used to invite me all the time. But the first time I went was with a famous writer, his name is Ahmed Ragab, and Ibrahim Al Maalim, who's a, a, a publisher. And really, I wanted to ask her all the time. I was afraid to ask her that question. How a beautiful lady like you, young, to marry, an old man, married, and has children, and he has no job. And I told her all of this, and she smiled, and she looked at me. She said, Zahi, he was a hero. Then she really looked at him as a hero. And she became in love with him because of what President Sadat did for his country. This is why she became in love with him. The other important thing that I found out that tourism in Egypt was really not good. I really, we need to promote Egypt. I called her. I said, we need you. She said, what? I said, we need to advertise your name for Americans. Then you can meet them in your home. And the reason that I asked her to do that, because I know how Americans love her. And this can bring money to the country, can fund. And tourism is very important to every house in Egypt. She said, Zahi, I will do it. And I don't want anything except I want to help Egypt. She used to meet all the people who will come to Egypt, maybe six groups a month in her house. And I met them next day. Half of my meeting, they're talking about her. How she is lovely, polite, wonderful, incredible. I mean, I just came before this interview giving a lecture to a group, an American group. You know, they are so sorry. We came to Egypt to meet Mrs. Sadat. We are so sad that we are not going to see her. We loved her. Exactly. This is what a man and his wife told me an hour ago. Then Mrs. Salat used to meet all of them in her house. She will sign her book and she will give a smile and she will talk to everyone equally and beautifully. And that is the talent of this incredible lady that she was really actually in my heart. When she doesn't answer me, I get afraid. There is something wrong with her. And I call uh, Noha directly that she will answer me. I said, how is Ilhanim? How is Mrs. Sadat? She said, she's fine. And she will talk to you now. We 
me and her are a friend of a lady. She's now 98 years old. Her name is Nancy Benz. You cannot believe how Nancy will talk about Mrs. Sadat. She will tell me, this lady is in my heart. I had dinner with her in LA, and she gave me two photographs. One of her was Mrs. Sadat, and one was Mrs. Sadat only. I put them in my office. Then I can see Mrs. Sadat almost every day. I feel I am with her every minute. And even many, many people do not know that Mrs. Sadat was an artist. I do have a painting that she did paint in my office. And really, all the people who come to my office, I meet many people every day. I talk about two people that I loved in my life. The first is Mrs. Sadat. And the second is Omar Sharif. And I lost the two, as I lost a big part of my life. But Mrs. Sadat will be recognized in our history. She, her name will be written in gold, not in history only, but in the hearts of every Egyptian. Because all the Egyptians loved her. You know why? Because she's down to earth. I will never forget in my life that she made a TV interview with a stupid uh, reporter. And she was telling him, Your Excellency. And I will tell her, You. The people everywhere loved her of the way that she doesn't deal with him with the same uh, way that this guy addressed her. But she does that because she wants to show the people that she's a, a lady with respect. Her name will be written in gold in the history of Egypt. Thank, Thank you, you, Zahi. Very well said. Um, and that's a great testament, obviously, to this great lady. Um, I'm going to turn to the Maryland connection of uh, Dr. Jehan Sadat and to our own uh, uh, President uh, Kerwin. Um, and I, I have to say that um, those of you who have known about um, uh, Mrs. Sadat's connection to Maryland that lost, that started before I came to Maryland because I came as a scholar after the chair had been established. Uh, but um, throughout her uh, presence at Maryland, prior to President Pines, whom we heard today, uh, there were really three presidents, um, uh, President Kerwin, President Moat, and President Lowe. Uh, and all three were great in working with her and with the Sadat chair, and she loved them all. Uh, Kerwin had a special place uh, because he was the first one that where they both bonded at, at Maryland. And I want to turn to you, uh, Britt. I know how much you love this lady and I know how much she loved you. And um, I want you to tell us, first of all, uh, how you met, you know, how you met initially, what your impression was, and how you came about to support the establishment of the Sadat chair. Uh, you are still, you are still muted. You are still muted. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shibley. Well, I, I, I first um, became, uh, uh, I first became aware of Mrs. Sadat, actually back in the 1970s. Um, I was a relatively young uh, professor at the University of Maryland and, uh, in the 70s, and this was a time when there was just intense interest in our country about the possibility of peace between Egypt, Egypt and Israel. So much so that uh, the great uh, news commentator, Walter Cron Cronkite, flew to Aswan, uh, Suez, excuse me, Suez, to do an interview with President uh, and Mrs. Sadat. And so there I was back in College Park uh, watching the evening news, and I saw this unbelievable presence. Of course, we were all impressed with President Sadat, but Mrs. Sadat, her elegance, her intelligence, 
her beauty. I mean, it made such an impression on me. And I was thinking, my goodness, I would love to meet that woman someday. And I thought, what a fantasy. That could never happen. <laughs> well, you, you uh, fast forward uh, a couple of decades. And so the question becomes, how did she become associated with the University of Maryland? It turns out that we had a very distinguished uh, political scientist by the name of Ed Azar, who was Lebanese. He was an expert, of course, on the Middle East and the politics of the Middle East. And he was a, an advisor to uh, government leaders. And he got to know uh, the Sadats uh, because of his expertise and his erudition and uh, got to know Mrs. Sadat very well. So when her husband was tragically assassinated and she began thinking about his legacy and what she might do about it, Ed Azar, who incidentally founded the Center for Conflict Management uh, here at the University of Maryland, began talking about the University of Maryland and why it would be the right place to create an, an endowed professorship uh, it, uh, in his honor to carry on his, 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 his legacy. And uh, Ed was a very uh, persuasive individual. And she it made sense to her. Here was this great research university right outside the nation's capital. All these uh, dignitaries would be coming through. It would have high visibility. So she agreed that Maryland would be the place where this uh, professorship would be created. Now, we then became the envy of higher education. There isn't a university in, in America who would, didn't want to have the Anwar Sadat uh, chair uh, for peace. Um, and um, so uh, just her agreement to do this suddenly shined a spotlight on the University of Maryland in the most wonderful way. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it was the excitement across the campus uh, that we were going to be associated with this great leader and with uh, Mrs. Sadat. So she threw herself into uh, the, the uh, effort to create this uh, chair, to help with all the fundraising that would be necessary. She moved to Washington, the Washington DC area. She became a fellow at the university. She was a constant presence on, on her, her our, on our campus. Uh, she would have events for her. I had a wonderful uh, evening in her beautiful home uh, that Dr. Hawass uh, talked about on the banks of the Nile River where we had a chance to talk about the chair and what it would mean for Egypt and what it would mean uh, for global understanding of uh, uh, issues of peace. But she, uh, she, she was, it, it's just hard for people who weren't uh, around uh, at, at the time to, to fully appreciate what he wrote and where Sadat and Mrs. Sadat were in this country. They were beloved uh, in, 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 in the U.S. And her presence, she was, uh, she, uh, her presence with, was just uh, f phenomenal. And so whenever she invited or was she was involved uh, in a, any kind of an event, uh, it, the, the attendance was assured. So we began having these events around the country. Uh, to raise funds for the Adat Sadat chair. I'll never forget, we had um, uh, a major dinner in New York City at a, uh, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And who were the co-hosts of this dinner? None other than Barbara Walters and Henry Kissinger. Uh, the ballroom was full. And uh, it was just, it was in a magical electric, uh, 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 electric evening. Um, we had uh, then a, a big dinner in Hollywood, uh, hosted by uh, uh, a very wealthy uh, couple in, in, in Hollywood. And guess who came to that dinner? I'll just show you this picture. This is a picture taken at, at that uh, dinner. And of course, you see in the middle, uh, Mrs. Sadat with Mrs. Reagan and the president. Uh, that's a younger version of me on the president's uh, uh, right. Uh, but uh, and at this dinner, 
this uh, this uh, uh, a, a person from born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky, was suddenly sitting at a dinner table with Kathy Bates, the Academy Award winning <laughs> movie star. That was Mrs. Sadat's ability to attract the rich and famous, as well as the common folks, to anything she she was involved in. I have to say that um, uh, this was, in many ways, the most exciting, but the easiest fundraising assignment I ever undertook because of her. People could not say no to her. That was just the this universal love for her. Uh, I got to meet uh, Farah Pahlavi, the Shah of Iran's wife, who made a contribution to the uh, 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 to, to the chair, and so uh, in fairly short order, we raised the funds uh, to make this uh, chair possible, and uh, then we began um, the difficult job of finding the appropriate first chairholder uh, for this very distinguished position. And of course, uh, there were lots of people interested uh, in the position, but it is a reflection of how, how prized this position was, that we were able to attract this rising star from Cornell University, Shibley Talami, to come to the University of Maryland and be the first and still only occupant of the uh, uh, Sadat chair. So it's, uh, it's just a wonderful, a beautiful story. But I want to make one other point, Shibley, um, about uh, her presence, uh, her impact on me, on, on the university. Her, um, her contribution to the university went so much beyond just raising the funds uh, for this chair and the creation of this wonderful chair, how great that is. But it, her contributions were even greater because it was a time when the university was paying special attention and had all sorts of initiatives surrounding the, uh, the matter of gender equity and the women's role in our, in our society. And she was a constant presence on our campus, giving inspirational talks, going wherever she was asked to go uh, to speak on these, uh, on these issues. And she told a story once, and I'll close with this. Uh, she told a story once that left such a deep impression on me, and it says so much about her character. As you mentioned earlier, Shibley, uh, 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 she got her master's degree, and then after her husband was assassinated, she went on to get a doctorate in comparative literature at uh, the University of Cairo. And so she would finished her thesis, and now it became time to defend her thesis. And she went to the powers that be at Cairo University and said, I want my defense to be on national television. And I said, what? On national television? People told, no, 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 you can't do that. Oh, my goodness. It's the pressure you'd be under. This would be impossible. You mustn't do that. You mustn't do that. And she said, no, no, I want my defense on national television because I want the women of Egypt to see a man asking a woman a question and the woman giving the answer. I get goosebumps to this day thinking about that, but it speaks so much to the character of this woman and, and, and her values and the impact she had on so many. You know, we have in Egypt the Jihan laws. These are all uh, uh, because of the work she did uh, about, on, on women's rights, making it possible uh, for women to pursue uh, the kinds of careers uh, that uh, they are able to do in this day and age. So um, let me just say, uh, Shibley, in closing, that um, I uh, spent uh, almost 30 years as a president uh, or a chancellor of uh, higher education uh, institutions. And my interaction with her, my association of, of, of with her stands uh, among the most important 
of uh, matters, uh, experiences in my professional career. Uh, and I can't help but think back to the 1970s when I thought, how could I ever meet this woman? And look what happened over those years and what an impact she's had on me personally, on our university, but I would say on the world. You're muted, Shibley. Yes, now it's my turn. <laughs> Thank you, Britt, for these really wonderful words, but also for what you personally have done for the Sadat Share as well as for our university and higher education broadly. Um, let me turn to Sharif uh, before I go to Noha because I want to talk Noha last for good reason, but I, uh, I want to talk to Sharif more about, you know, now that, um, you know, the, the uh, Dr. Sadat has passed, uh, you've had time to reflect more on her life. Uh, you are living through a relationship with her that started when you were a baby uh, through, uh, through until the time that she died. Uh, and uh, as I said, said later on, um, the, the, uh, as I said earlier, that you had, um, you, you, you as, as the eldest of the grandchildren, you received particular attention. So you knew them probably better than any of the other grandchildren, spent more time with them. And so I wonder when you're hearing the, you know, this testimony about her life, um, how did it look to you while you were living through it? Well, uh, from my point of view, she, the, the, she was um, a grandmother in every sense of the word. Uh, I mean, putting the politics and putting the public persona aside, uh, she was very much uh, the, the, the typical uh, caring, doting uh, grandmother, uh, where I'd spent my summers with her, uh, whether it was in Egypt or when she had moved to the States. I also used to go spend uh, uh, at least a month uh, at the house in Virginia. So uh, in that sense, she was very much uh, a grandmother. I was close to her because uh, when my mother had me, she was quite young. And um, my grandmother decided that she would basically take over. And she, she was very involved in my upbringing as such, um, all the way through, uh, even after my grandfather passed away. Uh, she was uh, very much involved. Um, of course, uh, uh, I'm hearing a lot of uh, wonderful stories. Um, some of them for the first time, some of them I had already heard before. Um, and, and, and a lovely reflection on her, uh, on her legacy. But like I said, for, for, for me, uh, first and foremost, she was uh, my uh, grandma who, you know, I used to go to uh, if I had any issues. I used to go to whenever I needed uh, help with anything, whenever, uh, well, when I was very young, if, if, if my parents uh, uh, were, you know, I, I didn't get what uh, I'd asked for something, it didn't work out, I'd go to her and, and she'd get it done. It's your, your typical, typical doting, loving grandmother. And uh, for me, hearing all this and how busy she was, it's amazing that she actually had the time and, and made the effort uh, to be involved uh, the way she was. Uh, she was certainly a family woman, first and foremost, and she loved the family, but she loved a lot of other people. And, and that showed uh, uh, over time. Uh, one more question to you, Sharif, before, before I turn uh, to Noha. Um, you know, obviously, given a grandson, uh, you, you're a different generation um, uh, than uh, some of us who are talking about her, who lived through the politics of her life, uh, you know, in, in a closer way. And so we have a, a little bit of a different uh, understanding of the role that she played in that history. But when you look at uh, people who are your age or younger, uh, or, Sa or like Sarah's age, or, or um, you know, uh, any of the other grandchildren, uh, do they have a different perception, you think, of her legacy? Um, has that impact them in the same way? I mean, we, I know here in the U.S., um, memories fade, uh, 
uh, even even 9-11 seems like history for some people. Uh, so I, I wonder how, how you see it in terms of uh, this generational perception. Well, um, I must say she's, she's, she remained to the end a public figure in the sense that uh, she was very much in demand uh, for, you know, uh, TV interviews, uh, journalists. So she was, she was quite involved. She was always there. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, the impact she has has lasted and transcended generations for sure. For me on a personal level, for example, um, the way I raise my own children, I have two girls and a boy. Uh, for the girls, I, I always tell them, there's, you're no different than any boy. There's no such thing as, as anything a guy can do, you can do for sure. One of them, for example, is on the uh, Egyptian uh, uh, skeet shooting team, uh, uh, which is slightly abnormal for, for Egypt. But, uh, so, so for us, I think that her legacy and, and her impact definitely transcend the generations, uh, mine and even younger than me. Yeah, it is remarkable. You know, this longevity of her presence is really extraordinary because she, in some ways she remained a first lady of Egypt throughout uh, and, and clearly was visible at the, in the political circle and the media uh, throughout, not just internationally, but certainly in Egypt. And so that's one of her strengths and, and, and the legacy that uh, she leaves behind. Um, Sarah, I wanna to turn to you um, in, in, to talk a little bit more about sort of your perception of her drive for women's rights, um, seeing it as a granddaughter um, uh, uh, with certainly a, a young woman who wants to see full equality like all of us wanna see, but we know that women don't yet have full equality. But you see her life, uh, you w watched her over the years, and now you hear more about how she looked to the rest of the world on this issue, where she's not just saying women need to be empowered by having jobs, by having economic power to get political power, but having education of their own, that she, she is not only preaching it, but she lived it. She didn't sit there even though she was on top of the world at some point. Uh, and yet she still wanted to stand on something independent that carried her through uh, after President Sadat was assassinated. Uh, it is really a, a, a powerful and empowering message. But how does that look to you? How did that inspire you personally? Um, she was an exceptionally inspiring and admirable person in many ways, but I think what you're talking about is one of the ways that really struck me watching her. She was uh, a role model because of her strength, and I think she was also very grounded. I mean, if there was a problem, if there was something happening, she would be very grounded, very calm, very assessing, very intelligent, and her reactions would always be extremely measured. And I learned that from her. I learned that you need to calmly look, watch, learn, and uh, find out what's happening, uh, uh, gather information. She never assumed, she would always listen. Uh, she would listen to people. She would listen to people who would come to her with problems. Uh, she'd pay attention to what was being said. And I think in that way, she was sort of, um, she was trying to, to keep up with what's happening with women and what's happening around uh, Egypt and in our generation, the younger generation. She also would always encourage us and encourage me personally. When I started working, I, I actually worked with Dr. Zay Hawes in the ministry. And she was one of the proudest people of me. She was so proud. And whenever I passed by her, because I had a lunch break or something, because her house was she drew me back to work go back and so she was very encouraging and the way she handled things was also a great learning experience for us to learn from uh, I mean th this um, uh, you know a lot of people could see obviously and you've experienced it firsthand um, so 
for you, when you're looking back and now she has left us, uh, uh, she has, she's left a, obviously a legacy that we're all celebrating. This is really an event of celebration. It's not an event of mourning because of all that she's done that's going to outlast many of us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so I want, you, I want you to think about what her legacy means to you. Um, it means a lot of things. I mean, one of the things that I always admired was her ability to balance her personal life with her work life, with her public and every person. She was always honest and only honest. I don't think I've ever seen, I don't think she's capable of being this honest. And I learned that from her. I learned that this is the way to go. Um, she also, something that wasn't mentioned, I think, uh, is that she had an unbelievable sense of humor. And yes. uh, she, she, yes. when, when we go to her yeah. with the problems that we used to get into and all the trouble, and we'd run to her, that's the first thing she would do. She'd start laughing and she'd turn it into a joke. And here we were crying or panicking or something. And we end up laughing. And she taught us that that's one of the best ways to go about life, to find the humor, to find the funny mm -hmm. side and just laugh. And then after that, you can start to figure out what you're going to do from there, you know? But her sense of humor is something that a person, I was just thinking, it's something that I'd love to have and I'd love to remember and I'd love to keep. I am so glad that you mentioned that, Sarah, because those of us who knew her well, so much appreciated her sense of humor. And that is in a way part of the reason why she was so modest because she was able to laugh even at herself. And um, she in that sense was very Egyptian. I mean, this is you know, a trait that Egyptians generally have. And I have to say that you know, all the proud Egyptians I have met, and I think most Egyptians are very proud people, uh, she was uh, the most proud Egyptian I have ever met. Uh, she was very proud of who she was. She considered herself first and foremost mm -hmm. as a woman of Egypt. She loved her country. She loved her people. Yes, she loved everyone else. She sought international peace and human rights and particularly women's rights. But above all, uh, I can see whenever we would meet an Egyptian, whether it's in Arizona or California when we were traveling, and someone comes to introduce themselves, no matter what they did, how old or young they were, the smile on her face would brighten up the room. So this was something really very special about her and it made everybody else smile and everybody else laugh and made everybody at ease. She always made people feel at ease, exactly. even in serious times. So now with, um, I want to thank you all for this incredible conversation, um, uh, remembering our friend, the woman we loved, the woman of Egypt. Uh, and I, now I would like to end by showing a slideshow of a moments, her moments on campus, particularly these great events when we together hosted extraordinary world leaders and Nobel laureates. Uh, uh, throughout the period that she was associated with us. So uh, please start the, the show, Kirsten. Thank 
Dr. Johanna Sadat, an extraordinary woman of Egypt, 1933 to 2021. What a life, what a legacy. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>